So um, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. On behalf of the National Transit Institute, I welcome you and thank you for participating. The National Transit Institute develops, promotes, and delivers training and education programs for the public transit industry in the United States. Today's webinar is based on TCRP Research Report 219, Guidebook for Deploying Zero Emission Transit Buses. Today's presentation will feature two main speakers, Meredith Linscott, Senior Engineering Consultant, Center for Transportation and the Environment, and Amy Posner, Engineering Consultant, also at the Center for Transportation and the Environment. There will be uh, two additional panelists, Eric Bigelow and Matt Booth. They will be speaking about uh, case studies and I think application of the guidebook. So here's a little bit of background about today's speakers. Meredith Linscott is a Senior Engineering Consultant and the Director of Legal Affairs at CTE. Meredith earned a Bachelor of Science in Industrial Engineering from Georgia Tech and a JD from Georgia State University. Amy Posner is an Engineering Consultant with CTE. Amy earned a Bachelor of Science in Engineering in Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering from the University of Pennsylvania and a Master of Science in Sustainable Energy Engineering from the University of Maryland College Park. Eric Bigelow, is a Senior Engineering Consultant and the Director of Midwest Operations with CTE. Eric earned a Bachelor's of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. Matt Booth is a Senior Engineering Consultant at CTE. Matt earned a Bachelor of Science in Computer Engineering and a Master of Science in Electrical Engineering, both from Virginia Tech. Today's session will consist of the presentation of the material and we'll have a question and answer session at the end that will be moderated by yours truly. However, if you have a question during the presentation, feel free to ask your question at any time by typing it in the Q&A box. If you don't see the Q&A box, you can enable it by uh, making your menu bar on the Zoom window appear, and it's one of the options. We prefer that you don't put the questions in the chat box because sometimes they get lost in the scroll. Um, if you do put it in there, I'll try to ask you to re-put it, repost it, retype it in the Q&A box. Uh, finally, if you have not already printed out a copy of the presentation handouts that should have been emailed to you, I will be pasting the link to do that as well as the link to download the, uh, the guidebook in the, in the chat box. So you, everyone should see that in a minute. And I guess that's it. I'm going to turn the presentation over to Meredith now. Wonderful, thank you, Lori. As Lori mentioned, my name is Meredith Lynn Scott. Um, today, we're gonna talk about the guidebook for deploying zero emission transit buses. And um, as we talk through that, I'm gonna uh, spend a little bit of time after, uh, in a moment to kind of give the other panelists a little bit uh, more time to provide some brief background on their experience with zero emission buses. Um, but as, as far as the webinar agenda, we'll, we'll start with those intros and then I'll talk a bit about the guidebook itself and, and how it came to be and how we intend transit agencies to utilize this guidebook and how we've laid it out in order to hopefully provide a great user experience for those looking to deploy zero emission buses. Um, I'll then hand it off to Amy Posner, who's my co-author of the guidebook, and she will um, provide a brief background on some of the content in, in the guidebook, and then we'll finish with some what we're calling deployments in action with Eric Bigelow and Matt Booth, my colleagues, that will talk through sort of some examples of, of these best practices in use. Um, and then as Lori mentioned, we'll wrap up with an opportunity for Q&A uh, from everybody on the, on the webinar. So uh, as I mentioned, I am Meredith Linscott. I'm co-author of the guidebook and have worked at CTE for over eight years. I'm currently the Director of Legal Affairs, as Lori mentioned, but also have over six years of uh, product deployment and project management experience with zero emission technology. I've worked on several electric bus deployment projects as well as an electric ground service equipment deployment at our local airport. And prior to joining CT, I have um, some experience in the insurance industry as well as as a consultant for uh, electric and gas utilities uh, in the US. Uh, and I'll just give a little bit of time for Amy, uh, Eric and Matt to introduce themselves as well here quickly. 
Yeah, yeah thanks, Meredith. Um, this is Amy Posner. I've been an engineering consultant at CTE for almost two years now. Um, my focus has been on providing uh, project management and technical support on battery electric bus and fuel cell electric bus deployments, uh, including one in one of the coldest parts of the country. Um, so I've also uh, done a lot of work to promote partnerships between trans agencies and um, electric utilities uh, throughout zero emission bus deployments. Uh, Eric? Hi, this is uh, Eric Bigelow with the Center for Transportation Environment. Um, I've uh, been, uh, been with CTE for a little over 11 years. Uh, I've worked on a variety of battery electric and fuel cell uh, bus deployments, uh, as well as a number of other zero emission vehicle um, deployments out there in the medium and heavy duty world. Uh, based in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, I lead our St. Paul office. Matt? Hi, everyone. It's Matt Booth here from Rainy Atlanta. Um, been at CTE about four years as a consultant. Uh, before that, I was in the battery electric business, bus business since about 1998, believe it or not. Uh, back then, there were about um, maybe five, six, ten people in the battery electric bus business. I mean, it was a small industry. Nobody cared. So it's great to see this many people turn out for this today. Uh, these days, I help cities have successful battery electric bus deployments. I'm currently working with Boston, Honolulu, um, I did a project for uh, the New York Port Authority, um, projects all over the country, really. So um, that's it in a nutshell, and I'll turn it back over to Amy or Meredith. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Uh, thanks, everyone. So as I mentioned, um, we'll start off by just talking about the guidebook and how it came into um, being with, regard with, with TRB um, and TCRP. So in 2018, uh, many of you may have been aware that TCRP issued the Battery Electric Buses State of the Practice Synthesis, which, uh, which helped provide a snapshot of the current state of the battery electric bus market and um, what practices agencies were using throughout their deployments to date in 2018. Um, a couple of the key takeaways from the report is that, uh, as you can see in this chart, the industry is rapidly growing and interest in the technology is as well. Um, and, you know, from 2016, when this chart was published in the, in the synthesis, we've seen similar growth within the market continue. Um, and so it's definitely a prime for kind of figuring out how we can come together and do these deployments in, in the best way possible. The other thing, the, uh, yep, oh, thank you, Amy, you can swap to the next. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> the other thing we, the state of the practice did was help identify some of the key drivers and challenges to adoption to date. Um, some of the drivers are, um, as you can see, increased product availability and options. Um, as the market has matured, so has the availability of options from different manufacturers for zero emission technology. Um, and within those offerings, uh, the catalog of products and range and everything has increased as well. Zero emission buses tend to provide cleaner, quieter, simpler rides than their conventionally fueled counterparts. Um, they essentially have fewer moving parts, and um, which obviously helps potentially lower operating costs. There's a lack of internal combustion engine which um, can negate the need for oil changes and regenerative braking features uh, also tend to help lengthen the life, life of brake pads. So there are some operational benefits that um, can potentially lower those operating costs. And then finally, obviously zero emission, zero tailpipe emissions. While there is some emissions from the source of where that energy is created locally and where these buses are being deployed, there are zero tailpipe emissions coming out of them. So that's, that's a great benefit for local communities. Um, some of the challenges that were identified in the report were range limitations. Um, we've seen some of that mitigated with some increased battery life over the past couple of years, but there still remains some complications with, um, with deploying the buses and ensuring they've got the range to satisfy your route requirements um, and required charge times and how those charge times relate within complicated utility rate structures. So um, when you're trying to deploy the technology, when do you charge? How long will it take to recharge? And how does that interplay with uh, utility rate structures and time of time of day charging or seasonal rates and things that can increase or decrease your cost of refueling your zero emission buses. 
Um, and then finally, higher capital costs. We've seen uh, the fuel cell electric bus pricing come significantly down in the past couple of years, and the battery electric bus pricing has come down some as well. Um, it hasn't quite as much as we've seen with fuel cell, and we think a lot of that is to do with just increasing the range of those buses and really putting that savings back into the bus to kind of make it available for um, an even greater variety of routes. But um, regardless of the type of zero emission technology, there is um, the, the need to deploy some related fueling infrastructure that's probably unique to your conventionally fueled vehicles. And so there is that initial capital cost that tends to be um, higher as well. And finally, the what the report concluded, or one of the key takeaways in the report, was just the need for more technical support and advanced tools um, for transit agencies that they can utilize to make objective procurement decisions and make planning decisions that um, help them make the best decisions for their agency and for their deployment needs. Um, and, and really concluded that if, if agencies were equipped with those tools, they'd really be able to reap the benefits of those advantages of zero emission technology and mitigate the challenges and, um, and help blossom the industry even more. As a response to that, TCRP solicited proposals for the development of this guidebook. Um, they recognized that need for support and wanted to produce a guidebook that transit agencies of any size can use in their deployment of zero emission transit vehicle fleets. Um, this includes both battery electric buses and fuel cell electric buses, which we um, collectively are calling zero emission buses in the report, um, and then their related infrastructure, depending on the deployment. The intent was to improve decision making and, um, and basically help agencies make uh, the right planning considerations, understand the service maintenance and operation considerations within these deployments and how they might vary from their traditional um, conventionally fueled vehicles. What are the costs and benefits of these deployments so that they can really get a grasp um, before and then uh, after the deployment, make sure they're realizing the benefits they anticipated. And then who are the key stakeholders that need to be engaged at different parts of your deployment and how do we make sure everyone is satisfied with the outcome of your deployment and, um, and that you're able to reach the goals that you set for your deployment. Uh, the other thing TRC, TCRP wanted within uh, the context of the guidebook was a quick turnaround. Um, I think they recognized that this was a tool that was, was already needed by the industry and so they really wanted somebody that could quickly um, turn out a, a guidebook for agencies looking to deploy this technology. And that's where we felt CTE was well poised to help because we have, um, we've worked with over 70 transit agencies across the US that have deployed or will soon deploy more than 300 zero emission buses and are currently assisting some of those transit agencies on full fleet transitions as different um, regulations and, and just local desires have, have created a, um, a desire for transit agencies to look at what it might take to convert their entire fleet. In addition, we have over 60 uh, member companies that are involved or have involved in sustainable transmission or have deployment experience in sustainable transmission or uh, transportation, I'm sorry. And um, we were able to utilize these member resources as well as some external resources to help kind of concur with some of the best practices that we've seen deployed throughout all of these deployments and um, that member resources have recommended to us as well. So we felt like that was kind of a good roundabout um, way of, ga of gathering all of this experience and creating this guidebook and, and synthesizing it for all to use. As far as the guidebook layout goes, um, it's, it, it took a lot of thought to try to think through how we wanna structure this guidebook in order for everybody to get the most use out of it. Um, and it's funny to spend a little bit of time talking through that in the webinar rather than the content itself, but we really felt that one of the, uh, the biggest challenges with putting all of this information into a tool is to try to organize it in a way that users can easily access and easily um, point to for, uh, as a resource for their deployments. So what we started, uh, we started the guidebook off with a technology overview 
which I can't emphasize enough, provides a snapshot of technology to date. Um, obviously, as that one slide earlier showed, this market is rapidly advancing. And so the options available to any agency looking to deploy this technology is changing pretty quickly. And the, and the options available for their deployment um, are increasing. And so we, wanna, we wanted to provide a context of what's available today, but also a little bit of a warning that there might be even more available as you look to deploy technology. And so um, here is some things and here's kind of your basic examples of hydrogen fueling stations and battery electric charging stations and the components required for each, but also check in what's available um, when you're looking to deploy and make sure there isn't other op there aren't other options out there for you. But we also, um, in the context of that, provide some example installation photos, which can help provide context to the size of these installations and the components required um, when deploying this to just give transit agencies an idea of, of the scale of these different items and um, making sure they have that information within their deployment um, decisions. And then finally, it provides information on typical installation um, styles and the advantages and disadvantages of each, just so you can kind of look at the pros and cons of, of each of the different, you know, charging infrastructure um, technology or whether you're producing hydrogen on-site or off-site and things like that, and just um, kind of providing some advantages to each of those decisions and disadvantages. As I mentioned, or, well, the guidebook is laid out in phases. So after the technology overview, we organize the guidebook into what we consider nine key phases of deployment. We have a 10 phase um, that we labeled phase 10 for ease of use. Um, that really talks about emerging opportunities that we think are going to be become more and more relevant with zero emission technology and wanted to highlight those for users to just say, be on the lookout for these as you deploy, as they might provide some um, more advanced options for your deployment. But as far as your specific deployment is concerned, we've organized into, into nine key phases. Um, and each phase is intended to guide uh, agencies through all of the steps needed for that particular step of deployment. Um, the phases start with a two-page overview that summarizes what you should expect within that phase, and then sort of a high-level uh, overview of some of the best practices that will be covered. And then, you know, as the guidebook covers battery electric and fuel cell electric buses, some of the concepts are general enough to either technology, but then there are other concepts that are specific to one technology or the other. So we utilized icons throughout the guidebook to help identify when a specific topic is relevant to either battery electric buses or fuel cell electric buses, so that after agencies have dis determined their deployment technology, as they utilize the guidebook, they can quickly identify um, concepts that are specific to that technology that they've decided to deploy. Um, we've depicted deployments and actions in yellow call-out boxes throughout the guidebook, which are real-life examples of the concepts that we've discussed within the guidebook. They aren't as detailed as what I would consider a case study to be in that they don't provide a lot of the background on the deployment, but rather a more specific snapshot of how that best practice kind of became relevant within a specific deployment um, so that you can kind of see it in practice. And then other key concepts are highlighted throughout in blue boxes. And the blue boxes aren't uh, specific deployment related call outs, but rather just um, what I would consider kind of aha moments with, with regards to the concepts we're dis discussing within the guidebook and, and just kind of help drive home the importance of some of the concepts and issues um, in, in sort of a, a context that makes them digestible. And so we've got those called out throughout in, in blue boxes as well. As I mentioned, each phase of the guidebook begins with a two-page overview. And this is another element of the guidebook that took a lot of thought in trying to figure out how we want to organize this. Um, this th the first two pages could really be an executive overview of what to expect within each phase of deployment and um, including you know, what, what's going to happen, what are some of the best practices you're gonna see, and then even more importantly or as important, 
who are you, who do you need to pull in within your organization in order to successfully um, work through this phase of deployment? Um, one of the challenges we felt like with some of these deployments is often just knowing when to pull in somebody um, and bring them into the discussion and, and so that they're engaged early on to help drive a change later. And so um, we felt like it was it, a great tool would be to organize all of the different key stakeholders on a single page in each phase of deployment of who you might consider bringing in for, for either guidance or assistance or just to help make decisions within that phase. Um, they're, they're categorized into four main categories. The first is the project manager, who is the person charged at the agency with, with the deployment. Um, and it, it provides some bullets on what they could expect to work through um, within that phase of deployment. And then it also, um, the second category is operations, maintenance, and facilities personnel, and what they might need to help think through for, um, within that phase, as well as procurement personnel, whether it's um, helping create a bus spec or get proposals out or um, um, sign contracts, things like that, where they're engaged within the process. And then finally, external stakeholders, which, could, which can be anything from the bus OEMs, utility contacts, third-party vendors, consultants, labor unions, or even other transit agencies, and when, when you might consider engaging those external stakeholders throughout, throughout this process as well. And then finally, the, the biggest overarching kind of concept that we really wanted to drill down when, when using this guidebook is that the guidebook is intended to be one tool in an agency's deployment, zero emission bus deployment toolbox. Um, the guidebook, one of the things we realized early on was it would be impossible to create kind of a prescribed approach to these deployments because every agency has nuances that, that make it different um, for them to deploy this technology. And so we instead wanted to create a resource that educates agencies on you know, what are the, what, why are we making this decision? What are the key um, problems we're trying to solve so that they can ask the right questions in order to get the right answers for their problem um, and making sure they think through all the considerations for their deployment um, specific to them. It's not intended to be a document you read once cover to cover and um, you have the potential to overdose on caffeine if you tried. Um, it's, it, it would seem repetitive at times and it would, um, it, as a lot of the material is written for when it's relevant and some of that means, some of that material is relevant in different phases of your deployment. For instance, your utility rate structures and um, pricing is relevant for when you're trying to think through your early decision on which technology route you might want to go, whether it be fuel cell electric buses or battery electric buses. Um, and how you'll power either your hydrogen fueling station or your battery electric bus chargers. But it's also relevant when you're later tracking key performance indicators and trying to understand what the actual cost of that fuel is once you've deployed your buses. And so we'll revisit some of those concepts in each phase so that you don't have to traipse back to phase two to figure out what, you know, to, to relearn that or, or re. Uh, visit that and then um, where it's applicable in phase eight or however um, it falls out. So, but we really wanted to make it where you, you have most of the information you need, need in each phase within that phase and so it can be um, sometimes repetitive. Um, as I mentioned, it's, it's one tool. One of the things we did at the end of each phase is provide a list of external resources that we think are also relevant that you should consult within that phase of deployment or, or, or we recommend you consult. And then um, at the end of the guidebook, we also have a glossary of a lot of the terms we utilize throughout the guidebook. And we have um, a list of current, well, I should say 2019 by America compliant battery electric bus models and other common industry standards that you uh, may come across as you're building specifications for your zero emission technology. And so, um, you know, these are just, again, little tidbits that should be, um, sh should be part of a greater toolbox that you utilize within your deployment and make sure you're, you're referencing um, all of those external resources as well. 
Now I'm going to hand uh, things off to my colleague, Amy, to talk through uh, the phases of deployment. Thank you. Awesome, thanks Meredith. Um, so yeah, I'm going to kind of provide some key takeaways and best practices that are at the foundation of each one of these phases. Um, uh, the guidebook goes into pretty extensive details about how to address each uh, phase and different topics during your deployment. Uh, so today we're going to try to condense uh, all the activities and the work that, uh, that you would be doing over about two to three years to deploy zero emission buses into, um, you know, the next 20 minutes. So um, it'll be a, a whirlwind tour. So starting with phase one, you know, before you issue any procurements, before you buy any buses, uh, it's critical that you establish your transit agency's specific needs, requirements, and constraints. You know, as Meredith said, and, and kind of we'll keep saying over and over, there is no one size fits all solution for zero emission bus deployments. Um, but, you know, we do recommend kind of following this framework that we've laid out, laid out on this slide um, and making sure that you have a really strong team um, to guide your projects throughout the entire uh, deployment process. Uh, both internal and external um, stakeholders, um, such as your electric utility, are going to be really critical to making sure that your project is kind of stays on track and is a success. Um, so first, the first step is kind of to establish your needs and constraints. So what are your transit agency's priorities with respect to zero emission bus deployments? Uh, you know, are you hoping to, for lower operational costs? Do you want to pilot out different technologies in your service area? Um, do you have to comply with, with local or state mandates to deploy zero emission buses? Or do you maybe have that one, you know, board member or policymaker that is telling you this is what you have to do, you have to deploy zero emission buses. Uh, so kind of understanding what your priorities are and um, kind of what your constraints are with operating um, capital budgets, all of that will help guide your zero emission bus deployment process. Um, and then after that, you wanna conduct a fleet-wide assessment to establish your long-term goals for zero emission bus deployments and develop you know, a master plan that, will, that you can use as a roadmap to achieve those goals. Uh, within that master plan, you're going to wanna to design smaller incremental deployment projects uh, that are going to, um, as a collective, help you meet your long-term goals. Um, mapping out these smaller deployment projects will allow you to incorporate lessons learned into future projects, um, also help you make the smartest investments possible. Uh, knowing kind of what charging, fueling, and electrical infrastructure you'll need and when you'll need it uh, will help kind of make your transition to zero emission buses as seamless as possible. Um, and because the market is advancing pretty rapidly, uh, making this an iterative process is really important. Um, a, you know, a common vehicle configuration or charging approach today might, you know, might be very different in a few years. So you'll want to revisit these plans every two years to kind of confirm your assumptions and, you know, incorporate lessons learned. Um, after you've established your goals and requirements, uh, phase two kind of focuses on selecting your technology and developing your technical specifications for both your buses and your fueling equipment. Uh, it's critical that you conduct some sort of engineering assessment to understand how your buses will perform in your specific service area. Um, you know, 120 miles, you know, in one part of the country is, is not going to be 120 miles in a different part of the country. Um, so this sort of engineering assessment can be pretty sophisticated. Um, you know, there's a lot of options. You could run, uh, you know, a software simulation of bus performance using specific route data, um, or you could, you know, get some, get some data from a neighboring transit agency or some other source in the industry and adapt that to your kind of what, you, what conditions you might expect your buses to experience. Um, or, you know, some folks have also experienced success with piloting um, a bus from an OEM or neighboring transit agency. Uh, so the guidebook does contain a framework for this engineering assessment and evaluation, but um, it's flexible enough to kind of, you know, meet your needs. Uh, so the, the images here on the slide show two examples of outputs of an engineering assessment for specifically, you know, a battery electric bus. Um, this type of analysis in general is going to be more applicable to battery electric buses because of their range limitations um, compared to fuel cell electric buses or conventionally fueled buses. 
Um, you know, battery electric buses aren't always going to be a one-to-one -one replacement uh, for diesel buses, where fuel cell buses might um, be able to, to do that more successfully. Um, but this, this first chart shows a block screening approach uh, where you kind of take a look at your blocks and evaluate what might be feasible for zero emission buses, uh, really based on the distance or duration. Um, and energy efficiency will vary um, on your zero emission buses due to a lot of different factors. So it's good to uh, build in some buffer in your planning to see you know, what can your bus do on a good day versus a bad day? Uh, what can your bus do with a new battery versus an, an old battery? Uh, so this engineering assessment will guide your selection for bus and fueling technology, um, inform your technical specifications, and also let you design a preliminary uh, deployment plan for when your buses go into service. Um, so like I mentioned um, on the previous slide, um, energy efficiency of your zero emission buses will be influenced by a lot of factors, uh, such as ambient temperature, um, We've seen, especially with battery electric buses, um, range can be cut at least in half on a very cold or very hot day due to the HVAC requirements. Uh, driving style, we've again kind of seen 20 to 30 percent differences in energy efficiency um, with different drivers. Uh, passenger load, the type of route, and the um, age of the battery, those are all going to impact the total range of, of your buses. Um, so it's really important to incorporate this into your planning and into your technical specifications. Um, the guidebook contains information on key concepts to address in your technical specifications. Um, some that are specific to, you know, the, the operating profile of the bus, um, acceptance criteria, inspections, warranties. Um, so making sure that you address all of um, those kind of zero emission, zero emission bus specific concepts, um, considering the variations in efficiency and to will, will allow you to be successful in your deployment, making sure that you have a bus that is useful to you on day one and you know on year 12 uh, to make sure that you um, can have some useful pieces of work for that bus to do. Uh, phase three focuses on understanding um, capital and operational costs and identifying funding opportunities to help pay for zero emission buses, uh, which do currently have higher capital costs than conventionally fueled uh, vehicles. Uh, the good news is, is that there are a lot of funding opportunities out there uh, to help with this through, um, you know, federal and state programs. Um, and as well as some, um, you know, a lot of a lot of utilities are now offering some um, some programs to support um, vehicle electrification. So there are a lot of opportunities out there. Um, and we, we do provide some guidance on estimated capital costs for zero, for zero emission buses and associated fueling infrastructure. Um, we have a conceptual chart here on the slide that um, kind of gives you an idea of a comparison of deploying fuel cell versus battery electric buses. Um, this is mostly to indicate that, you know, with, with small initial fleets, um, for your first couple of uh, zero, zero emission buses, the time and effort um, and cost for battery electric buses is, is going to be um, is going to be less than that compared to for fuel cell buses, um, due to mostly due to kind of the upfront costs for hydrogen fueling um, infrastructure, um, and um, and as well as kind of the space considerations when you are looking to um, to deploy battery electric bus charging infrastructure. It's usually less of a stress on your system with smaller, smaller uh, fleet deployments. Um, but you know, with, with larger fleets, we find that fuel cell electric technology and specifically the hydrogen uh, fueling infrastructure does scale more easily than battery electric uh, charging technology, specifically if you're talking about charging at your depot. Um, so, while incrementally more battery electric buses might require incrementally more chargers, uh, more fuel cell buses uh, won't usually require an entire new fueling station um, for each deployment. Uh, so the charts on, on this slide kind of reinforce this point where we compare just capital costs um, of a five bus deployment and a 50 bus deployment for fuel cell and battery electric buses. I uh, want to provide a few caveats here. Um, these are capital costs only, and they are based off of kind of current public pricing and based off of experiences of smaller deployments 
um, around the US. We don't currently have um, examples of large scale deployments in the US to kind of inform um, some of these costs for larger deployments. Uh, and there are also kind of so many local factors that will move the needle on lots of these costs. Um, but if you kind of just at a, at a high level comparing the, um, the magnitude of these costs for a five bus deployment, um, you know, you estimate that battery electric is about half the price. But if you look at a 50 bus deployment, you're kind of reaching that an intersection of those two lines in the chart that we saw um, on, the, on the previous slide. And it's also important to note again that um, because of the range limitations on battery electric buses, there's, there are varying capabilities. Um, so depending on how you set up your charging infrastructure, you might need more battery electric buses in a large fleet to do the same amount of work that a number of fuel cell electric buses can complete. Um, so we, we do think that it will take kind of both technologies uh, for a successful transition across the country, uh, but this kind of just gives you an, an idea of scale. Um, but we always kind of strongly encourage um, monitoring and kind of researching pricing before making any decisions. Uh, phase four is a more uh, battery electric bus phase um, where we kind of dive into looking at optimizing your uh, charging strategy, your fueling strategy, as well as um, optimizing fuel costs. Uh, so in, in this phase, we recommend developing an electricity rate model that will help you explore different scenarios for charging and deployment uh, so that you can try to minimize your electricity costs uh, while still meeting all of your service needs. Um, and, you know, is, this really can't be understated. Um, it's a, that a strong partnership with your electric utility is really critical, specifically at this stage, but throughout your, your um, zero emission bus deployment. Um, you know, your utility can help you understand how your rate schedule will change um, as you deploy these buses. Uh, what cost saving options exist through, um, you know, pilot programs or rate incentives or, um, you know, any infrastructure support. Um, and they can help you kind of understand what different charging strategies or approaches will be the most beneficial um, for you with respect to kind of, to, with respect to your costs. Um, and we, we also explore some concepts of charge management that, um, that can help you manage those costs, especially for large fleets. This is going to be pretty important. Um, because typically your peak demand is a big driver for, um, for driving up costs. Uh, so anything you can do to limit your peak demand could potentially save you a lot of, a lot of money. Um, there are some kind of, you know, sophisticated charge management software options that are, um, you know, coming to market now. There are a lot of vendors that um, are going to be offering this service, um, but with Smaller fleets, you know, it's not always required, especially, um, you know, with this, you could do charge management with manu manually plugging and unplugging in buses um, to make sure that, um, you know, you can limit that peak demand. Uh, kind of what's shown on this bottom chart here on this slide, um, the, the, um, the picture on the right kind of shows a scenario of battery electric buses going out, some coming back for a midday charge, and then most of the buses coming back around seven o'clock, and then you know, the second they pull into the bus yard, they get plugged in and they start charging. Um, but with charge management on the right, um, if you don't immediately kind of plug all of your buses in right away, you can shave off that peak, um, that demand peak um, to kind of have fewer buses charging simultaneously, basically cutting your peak demand in half, but still allowing all of your buses to be charged um, when you need them at the same time. Uh, so moving on to phase five, uh, we're kind of getting into the installation and deployment of fueling infrastructure. So for both uh, battery electric and fuel cell electric bus deployments, we address considerations for stakeholder engagement, site selection, design, permitting, construction, um, and deployment of your infrastructure assets. And uh, so really strong coordination between all the stakeholders is really gonna be critical here and making sure that you clearly identify what the responsibilities are between um, all the parties involved. Um, we've mentioned kind of the third point a little few times already that you, you don't wanna just design your infrastructure for the deployment that's kind of right in front of you. You wanna consider what your long-term plans are uh, when you're you know, in all of your deployments 
um, and try and find ways to incorporate flexibility into your current design um, that will make future infrastructure installments easier. Um, you know, do you want a very extra conduit? Um, you know, considering where you're placing equipment, things like that that will make it easier for you to expand in the future. Um, the final point here I want to call <laughs> I want to call everyone's attention to is kind of one of the most important concepts um, and and, uh, and issues that have come up in a lot of uh, zero emission bus deployments. And it might seem extremely obvious, but it can be really challenging um, to implement in practice. Um, so it's 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 important to as much as you can try to have your fueling infrastructure installed and commissioned before any of your buses show up. Uh, you know, the last thing you want is uh, for buses delivered that you can't adequately test or use during your acceptance period because you don't have um, the chargers or the, or the fueling station um, ready for them. Um, so, and it's, you know, like I said, it seems obvious, but it is, it can be extremely challenging. Um, it's complicated, especially if you issue separate procurements for your buses and your fueling infrastructure. And, you know, delays that are outside of your control with, you know, between permitting and utility coordination to get a new service set up. There's a lot to juggle, a lot to plan for. Um, so it's kind of critical to, to think about this early to make sure that all of the schedules, all of the procurements, everything kind of match up so that by the time your bus has arrived, your charging or fueling infrastructure is ready to go. I'm going to breeze through some of these, these, uh, these later phases, but um, phase six is kind of focused on what you do after your buses arrive, um, having a strong inspection plan, um, acceptance testing plan um, to make sure that your buses conform to your, you know, the very specific and well-informed technical specification that you developed in phase two. Um, we also recommend doing validation testing uh, that will validate the actual bus performance against the engineering assessment. Um, from phase two. So this involves road testing under lots of different conditions to see how, um, you know, to test your assumptions and if you need to revise your deployment plan. Um, your validation testing results aren't always going to be able to be used as acceptance criteria, but it's, it's kind of the strongest tool you'll have before you put your buses into service. Uh, so phase seven is focused on training, uh, which is critical to the safe operation and maintenance of your buses. Uh, your bus and fueling infrastructure contracts will most likely have requirements for the OEMs to provide training. Um, how much is, you know, up to you and what your transit agency needs. Um, but making sure that your staff gets strong um, safety training, operations, maintenance, and fueling training um, is really critical. Um, and making sure that you can coordinate with your OEMs um, and first responders in your community to get the first responders trained on the buses and infrastructure. And uh, we've seen a kind of few different approaches um, by trans agencies for rolling, how to roll out training to staff, especially for earlier small deployments. Um, again, you know, no one size fits all. So we um, outlined some considerations in the guidebook to help you determine what your needs are based on um, on kind of your goals of your deployment. Uh, so since zero emission buses are still pretty new to the market, um, there, there aren't a lot of um, best, you know, best practices for domestic examples of, of zero emission buses being on the road for long periods of time. Um, so, you know, everyone is still learning kind of what are the best practices for um, operation and maintenance of zero emission buses. Um, but, you know, we, we do have a couple things, um, you know, to make sure you guys look out for. Uh, the first is kind of uh, promoting efficient driving behavior. Um, you know, we 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 spoke about how um, you know a, a, the difference between drivers can cause can we can see a twenty to thirty percent difference in uh, energy efficiency. Um, so any efforts to promote energy efficient driving can be beneficial to your operations, but um, I'm sure as as all of you guys expect, actually implementing something. Um, can be can be pretty challenging. So just um, figure out if that is something worthwhile and possible at your trans agency. Um, a lot of, you know, parties need to be involved in kind of understanding the implications of a program like that. Um, as well as monitoring the state of health of your battery to um, understand, um, you know, the warranty conditions. And another key takeaway is um, related to maintaining a spare parts inventory um, and and 
kind of more specifically understanding what lead times you might be working with for some spare parts. Um, we've seen some trans agencies experience really extended periods of downtimes with zero emission buses because some parts that they need um, have really long lead times or need to be fabricated. Uh, one of the, the biggest questions that I'm sure everyone has is um, what are the costs to maintain a zero emission bus? Um, you know, there, there certainly is a lot of promise that um, lower maintenance costs are possible for zero emission buses because of the fewer moving parts. Uh, but with the current state of the industry, it is, it's, it is pretty hard to tell um, of how maintenance costs are going to compare to conventionally fueled vehicles. Um, Meredith mentioned that this is just one tool in your toolbox. Um, so we really do recommend um, one of the best resources for kind of understanding operational costs and, and getting some real information from deployments are reports from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, um, two of which are shown in the screenshots here. Um, they provide a lot of great examples from, uh, from real deployments. Uh, so kind of the last key deployment phase is phase nine related to data monitoring and evaluation. Um, after your, your zero emission bus fleet is in revenue service, collecting and analyzing bus data will help you better understand performance, reliability, durability, and cost. Um, and all of this information will help you inform, you know, how do your buses perform year round? How do your buses perform on different blocks? How do they perform compared to other non-electric fleets? Um, so it really gives you the, the, the tools that you need to understand all of the impacts that, um, that can affect energy efficiency of your buses. Uh, some, some things to keep in mind when designing your uh, key performance indicator, our KPI program, is that managing different sources uh, of data from, um, you know, different departments in your, in your transit agency, um, other third-party vendors, different OEMs, that can be a challenge. Um, so just make sure your requirements and your processes are set up to um, take all that data. Um, and also try, trying to manage expectations for all of the different audiences that are going to want your data. Um, what your board wants is definitely not going to be the same as what your uh, service planners want and need to make decisions. Um, so making sure all that's captured in your requirements. Um, so these are just two examples of some kind of common key performance indicators. The, um, the chart on the left shows um, a illustrated, it's all um, illustrated data of kind of comparing monthly average cost per mile to um, an electric fleet versus a non-electric fleet. Um, so doing that fleet comparison can be really helpful. And again, you can kind of monitor um, the, the, any seasonal variability. And on the right, we have kind of showing how kilowatt hours per mile can change uh, with ambient temperature. Um, so the, the zero emission bus market is, you know, constantly changing and evolving. And I'm sure, um, you know, we just breeze through <laughs> these nine phases for this, you know, 200 something page guidebook. So I'm sure it can definitely feel like drinking out of a fire hose. Um, so by the request of the panel that helped us um, kind of review and finalize this document, we outlined some topics that are emerging in the industry that uh, we think can change how zero emission buses are deployed. Um, so a lot of these I mentioned already, but maybe one that's on this list that isn't as obvious is um, getting as much bus and battery data from deployments across the country as possible. Um, really understanding how, um, how batteries change over time, over the 12 year service life of a bus at least, um, will be extremely valuable to the industry and allow for kind of more universal um, adoption of these buses. Um, so speaking of emerging opportunities, uh, before I hand it off to, um, to Eric, I want to um, just do a quick plug for, um, for an event that's coming up, um, CTE sponsoring the Zero Emission Bus Conference again this year. It's going to be completely online. Um, there are going to be six sessions over the course of three days. Um, so this conference is completely free. And um, you can register at zebconference.com. Um, should be some great, um, great sessions, great presentations that will kind of dive in more um, in depth into some of these topics that we covered today. Um, so Lori, I don't know, do you, did you want to take a quick break for questions? I haven't been monitoring the chat or do you want um, to um, move on and 
I think Lori had to step away for just a brief moment, but okay. I've kind of been checking it out and we haven't had too many yet. So I think it's okay to go ahead into, um, into the deployments in action and then we can save the Q&A uh, for the end of the presentation. Okay, great. All right, Eric, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks. Um, so uh, for this, I'll uh, be talking about two on-route charger deployments um, that we were involved in the analysis and planning work for. Um, both of these projects going in uh, had an initial plan design as part of how the project was initially submitted. And in both of these cases, um, had a detailed analysis of really uh, digging in and trying to understand how and look at all the factors that might influence um, vehicle performance, as well as meshing that with the transit agency's need, uh, both led to different conclusions from, um, uh, from the initial plan. So um, one, one more drastic change and one um, more moderate. So uh, next slide. Okay, hey, so uh, first one to talk about is um, a project deployed in Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, the initial plan had uh, six on-route charge buses and um, two on-route chargers from, um, you know, from a just back of the envelope standpoint, um, accommodating six, uh, six on-route charge buses with two on-route chargers, which were in the you know, 450 kilowatt neighborhood uh, should be should be quite easy, um, just based on how how long it takes a vehicle to charge and how um, how much energy a vehicle may have on board. So, from again, from a back of the envelope submission, um, that was uh, really pretty pretty straightforward. Um, <clears throat> so, as well, just for um, understanding how the context of the agency this is about an 80 bus fleet. So um, having those six buses in regular service is, uh, is important. Um, and uh, also want to say, you know, it's, it's a no surprise that Duluth gets cold. Uh, the picture here is actually from March, which means it actually was a few months after the coldest days. Um, so uh, not, not a surprise. Um, so the challenge here uh, really came in a combination of factors together that made this on-route charging as originally envisioned uh, really difficult. So uh, with, with that seasonal variability um, comes a, a shortened range, which we can uh, look at with it, the kind of service planning. Um, but that increased uh, energy usage also led to an increased charging requirement. Um, and in uh, Duluth, there's no single route that could utilize all of these buses or, or even two routes. So these buses would need to go into service as part of the overall fleet. Um, and without uh, making changes to the existing schedule, which is uh, always, uh, you know, carefully built over a period of years with a lot of stakeholders. Um, uh, that, that was not uh, something we're able to do. So uh, it would be really difficult to plan for the sort of worst case charging to handle the coldest days and the amount of time. Um, so uh, in addition with all of that, uh, looking at how the actual charging times could line up, there's a, a real risk with uh, things not running like clockwork, which of course does uh, happen certainly on the coldest days, but even on the best of days. Um, it was, uh, would be a real challenge to have those vehicles uh, actually get charged and not be in competition for the charger. And also the planning department saw this as a future planning constraint that would be difficult to plan around. So. Um, so I guess uh, if you, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the, the solution in this case actually was to uh, transition this over to depot charge buses with depot chargers. Um, and this was actually a, uh, for, for the existing service that the transit agency had, this was a great fit operationally. So had operational flexibility. Um, the uh, planned cost for the second uh, on-route charger was um, we're able to uh, get basically an additional bus out of the same funding. Uh, and we also opened up the potential for off-peak charging and reducing some of the costs. So 
Uh, in this case, it ended up being a pretty dramatic change. What looked like something that was really straightforward to start ended up being a really pretty challenging uh, to implement and a much better solution in this case were, were depot charge buses. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, next one is a project in Portland, Oregon, TriMet. So uh, this is a 25-mile a uh, loop. And um, as the original plan had a 250 kilowatt hour battery, uh, battery pack uh, and a 300 kilowatt charger. Uh, in, in this case, the, uh, the 25, you know, looking at a 250 kilowatts on board and a 25 mile loop, um, you know, again, kind of from a back of the envelope standpoint, that, that, sounds, that sounds fine. You know, uh, it's, it's hard to imagine uh, not making it back with a 250 kilowatt hour battery, um, trying to complete a 25 mile loop. And in fact, even if you miss a charge, um, you'd still be fine with, uh, with that 25 mile loop and that energy, even under, um, you know, some, some really challenging considerations, and throw, throwing a lot of the worst case uh, add-ons to that. Um, so in this case, but we still wanted to make sure that the kind of the best decision was being made. Uh, so challenges again, uh, you know, of course, seasonal variability. In this case, uh, Duluth did end up with a uh, diesel fired heater or auxiliary heater. Uh, TriMet in Portland uh, was going to be all electric. Um, so there was a, a needing to account for that seasonal heating variability. Um, and in addition, wanted to make sure that uh, with, with any scheduled disruptions, in this case, this was a fully electrified route. There were five, five buses um, being, re five diesel buses replaced by five electrics. So um, it's important for uh, having some resilience with um, arrival times and traffic and any variance that may come. Um, so in this case, where we ended up at was the uh, actually a better solution was actually a smaller battery. So um, by, by looking at the details, we actually were able to determine a, a pretty small or almost negligible benefit from that additional battery uh, storage on board. Um, but uh, by reducing that battery capacity, we're able to largely make a cost trade for a higher power charger. Uh, and that higher power charger um, actually provided better ability to handle any schedule variance and seasonal variation, um, did reduce the vehicle weight, and um, uh, yeah, was basically able to, to accomplish, I think, uh, provide a more resilient and better solution for the same cost than proposed. That's, that's it. Uh, thanks. Uh, Matt? Yeah, thanks, Eric. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about Albuquerque Rapid Transit, and this is maybe a counterexample. Um, although we're going to hit on some of the same themes that Eric just talked about, um, in particular energy management, which does tend to be the problem, uh, the biggest problem to overcome with these deployments. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, you know, one of one of our biggest. I mentioned up front that we help cities have successful deployments, and one of the uh, you know, one of the first things we usually have to do is, is go in and meet with the, the transit agency and kind of throw cold water on their plans and say, hey, you know, the, what you think might work may not be the actual uh, solution for you. The, the, there's this problem where these buses, they look exactly like the buses they're replacing, but they don't act exactly like them. So, all right, so Albuquerque Rapid Transit is a uh, bus rapid transit system. It's currently in operation in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. It runs right along historic U.S. Route 66. Um, and it was proposed back in 2016, actually probably proposed earlier than that, but uh, tried to be implemented in 2016. Uh, next slide, please. So it's, it's actually a, an amazing uh, system if you're a transit nerd like I am. Uh, this picture from the Albuquerque Journal shows the uh, the BRT-like features that they have. They have a bus lane, a dedicated bus lane. They have traffic signal priority. So as the buses approach these signals, the signals turn green for the buses. Um, they have these uh, stations that are in the middle of the street. And you can go to the next slide, please. So the buses themselves have uh, doors on either side of the vehicle, which allows them to approach these platforms. 
uh, you know, no matter what bus, no, no matter what direction the bus is traveling, and uh, you know, without steps uh, to uh, aid uh, em embarking and disembarking. And you can see these kiosks here where passengers can buy tickets before they uh, board the bus, so there's no kind of delay at the fare box. So they really uh, took the rapid transit system, the bus rapid transit system, and to the maximum here. And plus, the system was designed from the ground up around battery electric buses, and that's pretty cool. Next slide. All right, so in July of 2016, the Albuquerque Journal wrote, the bus batteries are guaranteed for 12 years, can run a vehicle for 290 miles, longer than the longest route, and recharge in just three hours. So there was a lot of excitement in the city, um, uh, to say the least. The, the project was actually fairly controversial because even from, from the very beginning because uh, of, the, of all the construction costs involved and tearing up Route 66 and the bus lane and the prohibition of left turns along the line. But there was a lot of it. So it was a, it was a, um, it was not a uh, under the radar kind of project. It was a very high profile project. Next slide. So um, you saw there that the Albuquerque Journal was saying the buses were going to go 290 miles. So in uh, 2018, the city hired CTE to come and take a look at that uh, claim. So when we looked at this, we were seeing and projecting that the buses would go more like 150 miles. Um, that's a pretty big gap between the the 290 miles that uh, the Albuquerque Journal was was claiming. So uh, that, in fact, turned out to be uh, quite a problem for the city. So, uh, and actually, if you if you look at it in the details, if it was this really hot day or a really cold day, they probably wouldn't even get 150 miles even with the brand new battery. So, okay, not necessarily uh, a, a, a deal breaker here, because what do the buses actually need to do? Well, it turns out that the block length in Albuquerque on ART, the average block length, length runs around 230 to 240 miles. So actually, maybe that is a showstopper then. Next slide. So uh, here, here is 2018. There's a dark cloud over the project. The, uh, literally, the buses never entered service. They did enter testing. Uh, you can see here um, several of the buses. They actually bought 15 of these buses. And the associated charging infrastructure, you can see here, those are the chargers to the left and right of the buses. Uh, those, uh, of course, the poles in the foreground are, are just lights, but the poles uh, at the chargers are cable management systems for the charger. So the city you know, spent quite a bit of money on infrastructure, both of you know, at the depot and for the, for the buses themselves. Here we are in 2018 though, and the buses are unable to enter service. It's all over the newspaper. Um, it's, a, it's a huge controversy. And uh, let's go to the next slide. And then here's what happens next. The mayor pulls the plug on the electric bus deal. Next slide. And here are the buses actually uh, leaving Albuquerque, going back to the uh, manufacturer. Wow, that is, uh, you know, think about all the effort that went into acquiring these buses, building infrastructure, getting the buses there, and then here they go back. Next slide. So what went wrong? Well, basically what went wrong is they didn't follow um, the process that's laid out in the guidebook. Now, there was no guidebook at the time, but, um, but basically that's you know the long and short of what went wrong is is they didn't they didn't follow the process at least not in the right order so um they certainly did establish their needs and constraints they knew exactly what they needed to do um they they knew what the block links were and they they bought vehicles that they thought were going to be able to do it but what they what they didn't do though is um one thing they didn't do was design a smaller project first. You know, they, they just went for it. And, and that's, that's okay. I, I think it's okay to just go for it. You know, the smaller project up front is certainly optional. But if you're going to skip that, then uh, you really need to make sure that you've, that you've done your homework and, and done it well. And unfortunately, that didn't happen um, in Albuquerque. So was there a, a fleet-wide assessment? Um, 
Was there technical evaluation done? I, I actually, I can't tell you for sure because I wasn't there at the beginning of the project. Uh, you know, they hired us after the fact to, after the buses were already there to try to, to figure out what went wrong. But, um, but what's clear to me is that if there was any kind of technical evaluation, if there was any kind of fleet-wide assessment, it was more of the back of the envelope type. And it wasn't the kind that they needed to ensure the success of their project. So um, they actually, you know, we actually did do a rigorous assessment, but it happened after implementation. So at that point, unfortunately, uh, you know, we can't wave a, a magic wand and, and fix the bad planning. We did give them a few options about how they might be able to, uh, to make it work, but um, you know, involving on-route on charging, but these buses weren't built for on-route charging, so it would have been um, not as, as slick as what you just saw with Eric's presentation. Uh, it, would have, it would have involved a lot of complications that the city was unwilling to do at that point. So uh, basically, you know, this, this project failed. And today, if you go ride art, uh, you'll be riding on a, a diesel bus. And that's, you know, we're the Center for Transportation and the Environment. We, that's not what we want to see. We want to see, um, you know, these clean transportation deployments. So uh, not, not, to, not to startle you, scare you too much, but, you know, the, the takeaway here is, is use the process that's in the guidebook. Uh, this process, you know, when, we, when, when uh, Amy and Meredith wrote the guidebook, they didn't, they weren't just writing it out of thin air. They were writing it based on their own experience and, every, and everyone else's experience with what has worked, what hasn't worked, the right order to do things in. Um, there's a lot of good information in there. Um, and, you know, I think the good thing is that, you know, you don't necessarily have to hire CTE, we'll certainly work with you, but, you know, this process can work with anybody. It's, you know, if you follow the process, um, and you and you do your you do your homework and you do it adequately. Of course, just the important part that um, that you know you can succeed following this process, and that's what we want. That's our mission to um, to have clean transportation throughout North America, throughout the world, even. So that's um, that's your counter counter example, and maybe hopefully your motivation to uh, to go out and uh, do your homework and do these projects the right way. These are amazing projects. I've been working on these projects, like I said, for a long time. I've worked on fuel cell buses, battery electric buses, hybrid buses, and um, you know th they're really special and they're um, it's something that I'm, that I'm I'm really excited about and really uh, you know happy to to help succeed. So thanks for your attention. I really appreciate it. And I guess we're going to take some questions now, Amy. Yep, thanks, Matt. Yeah. Hi, this is Lori again. <laughs> um, oh, there's your email addresses in case anyone uh, would like to contact you about any of the content. I guess we'll just uh, look at the, there seems to be seven, eight. Okay, the number's going up with open questions. We'll just go through them uh, in the order that they came in. So the first question is from Nathaniel. Have any of you guys taken a look at UITP's bus tender structure document that has a section on electromobility? Um, yeah, this is this is Amy. Um, I I'm not personally familiar with with that um, with that document. I mean, it sounds like it might um, be similar to the APTA bus procurement specifications. Um, Eric, have you, um, do you have any experience with that kind of document from UITP? Uh, I don't directly, Matt, I know you've done some with UITP, but I don't know if that in particular. No, I'm afraid not. We'll check it out. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think related to that, Amy, to your point though, um, when I, when I, I tried to quick look at it while we were, we were, walking through the presentation here and um, it does seem to be uh, potentially some, similar to some of the um, and as a resource similar to the APTA uh, bus procurement guidelines that are um, soon to incorporate some guidelines for zero emission bus technology um, and so I think that is an additional similar resource that that should be available I, I believe soon for for many as well. 
Great. Um, next question is actually about the slides. Um, we, it came up in the chat box. I don't know if everyone saw it. Um, there was a more recent version of the slides than the one I received to make the handouts ahead of time. So as soon as they send me the updated one, I will make sure that the updated version goes out uh, probably with the email everyone should get to take the survey. Uh, it, just a quick survey about today's session. So the link, including the missing slides, should be in that. Uh, probably go out tomorrow morning, I imagine. So thanks, Lori. I just uh, I want to make one quick comment on that as well, and just and just to make it clear because we um, we we meant to kind of say this up front is that the the case studies we discussed today are. Um, we, we wanted to provide, because the presentation was very much about just guide, the guidebook and the principles within the guidebook, and, and the case studies within the guidebook themselves are really more like deployment and actions, which, for instance, Duluth wouldn't necessarily give a whole case study on Duluth. It might give a case study about how, um, you know, different, how, how the climate and weather conditions within your area might need to be considered with regards to any impact on range and things like that. And so, um, for this presentation, we wanted to just give a little bit more context to some of those deployments and how the guidebook principles can be applied within them or, or, or may have been applied to help prevent some things. Um, and so I, I just didn't, I want to be sure people didn't expect to see these case studies specifically highlighted within the guidebook itself. It was more to help bridge um, the guidebook discussion into the Q&A and give some examples of, of these concepts in action. And then I also wanted to point out really quickly that a lot of those examples, well, the examples tended to have a lot of emphasis on battery electric bus deployments rather than fuel cell deployments. And, um, you know, I, I just to put a little context to that, a lot of a lot of the complications within with 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 the fuel cell technology or the challenges can be just the deployment of the fueling infrastructure up front. And then once that is done, um, they're they're. T tend to be fewer implementation um, challenges with that technology. And so I think that's where we chose to focus on some of the battery electric bus technology, just because the, um, a lot of times from its, uh, its, its uh, smaller initial capital costs can be a technology that agencies may turn to initially, and, and there can be some of those challenges, and we want to highlight some of those um, today. So I just, I just want to kind of set that expectation with everyone as they download the guidebook and, and make sure they're aware of um, that they won't see these case studies specifically, but that we thought they provided some good context to some of the concepts we discuss. So, Great. Um, the next question, uh, again from Nathaniel, what is the current lifespan of normal buses in the U.S. as compared to the 12 years of an e-bus? Uh, sure. So. Um, I mean, it does uh, vary um, by trans agency, but typically what we see is um, a, you know, 12 hour expected service life of, um, of a diesel bus and for an electric bus. Um, some trans agencies do, um, you know, use their buses for much longer, but it just kind of depends on available resources and kind of what, um, what their expectations for their buses are. Um, I don't know, Matt, do you have anything to add to that? I think you may have misspoken said 12 hours, but um, you know, 12 years, <laughs> of course. <Yep. laughs> Yeah, the, uh, that's one of the, the, the good points about any kind of battery electric bus or, or, or fuel cell electric bus. The propulsion system itself, the electric propulsion system, uh, should, you know, should have a, a long life. Like the, just take the motor, for example. Normally, there's almost no maintenance over the entire 12 years of the, of the service life. And uh, some of the buses that um, I'm aware of some buses operating where the traction motors have lasted in excess of 20 years, uh, basically with, with no maintenance whatsoever. So is the, the, the propulsion system itself, um, electric propulsion system, very long lived, very low maintenance. The, real, the, you know, the issue is the energy storage system for the most part and, and fuel cell uh, overhauls if you're looking at fuel cell buses. So it's, it's the degradation of the battery that, that does uh, become a, an issue. Uh, you know, some manufacturers replace, um, recommend replacing them at the six year mark. Uh, so that's kind of your major maintenance during the lifespan of the bus. Thanks. Um, 
Okay, so Nathaniel, you already asked two questions. I'm going to kind of skip over you right now. We can come back if we have time, but um, you're sort of dominating the Q&A here. So I'm going to go to Michael's question. If OEMs make claims of range, what are those claims based on? Is there a standardized testing protocol that accounts for many for the many variables that influence energy consumption with OEM range claims? Um, I might, yeah, give that one to, to Eric. Yeah, um, so sh short answer is, is no. There's no, there, there are some standardized uh, testing cycles that are done at Altoona, and they are at this point more uh, what I would call a real world testing cycle. And, um, it, you know, acting like a conventional drive cycle instead of something that's too artificial. Um, so that is a, one good standardized uh, piece to, to look at, um, but that doesn't account for all of the other pieces that uh, defrosters and battery thermal management system and um, you know, a, a number of other things that can impact energy consumption uh, in um, kind of in the real world. So. Uh, Short answer is no, and then what their claims are based on. Uh, probably it's, it's an important, you know, maybe depend on, on what the question is that you ask. Maybe a part to really be aware of. Okay. Next question comes from H. Kapoor. What is the cost of midlife overhaul of an electric bus? Is there a need to replace the batteries as required with the hybrid buses? I'll, I'll switch to Matt for that one. <laughs> Uh, actually, I don't think I've got a good number on that. Eric, do you? Uh, I, I don't, um, or at least I don't know uh, if if numbers I have are might be uh, sent, you know, kind of business sensitive to any of the the manufacturers. But um, I, th I think the important thing is the the you know the if the degraded range or the sort of lower range of a battery is still something that works with your system. And there's typically vehicles that go out for different ranges um, that may not be strictly necessary. You know, so there are a number of manufacturers out there saying that as far as the calendar life goes, you should expect them to last or they could potentially last out for 12 years. Um, so uh, that's, that's not answering the question. I think it is, it is important to have that as a budget line item and kind of a cost reservation as you're thinking about large fleet planning. Um, and then hopefully, you know, it's a, hopefully it's a positive surprise. Thank you. Uh, the next question from Erlen, uh, any case studies for fuel cell bus deployments? And I did notice that further down in the question list, uh, Leslie posted a link but I don't know if you have anything to add to that. I might let uh, Meredith take this one. Um, we in the in the guidebook. I, I I believe we have some deployments and actions that will that will highlight some things with regards to the fuel cell deployments. But as far as today and some of these case studies that we've called out today, obviously no. Um, I think again, it, it the. A lot of the challenges you'll see within a fuel cell bus deployment are kind of the challenges you'd see with any major construction project if you're um, unless you're you're bringing in some temporary fueling infrastructure that is a little smaller. But um, so those those issues tend to be more um, early on in the process. And I, I think Eric and Matt may have opinions on this as well. But then, uh, you know, later, once you've deployed the buses, um, some of the more challenges, some of the challenges that you tend to see with the battery electrics um, that are, are more about how you're deploying the technology and where don't tend to be as great of an issue with that. It's, it's really kind of the more upfront space infrastructure construction um, and, and source requirements for that type of deployment. I don't know, Matt or Eric, if you guys have anything to add there. No, I think it's great. And, and someone pointed that that AC Transit and, and SARDA and Canton Ohio are two, um, uh, two fleets. And then there's also uh, the uh, another, another large fleet in uh, Sunline in Palm Springs, as far as what fleets are actually out there today. Okay, next uh, is from Chris, who helpfully answered the previous question. Uh, for transit that need a range of 250 miles in order to deploy, can we expect that EVs will get there in the next five to 10 years? Or is the option FC EVs? 
Sure. Um, let's see. Uh, Matt, do you have a good answer for this or any thoughts? Or do you want to? Uh, you want me to sell my crystal ball? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think that um, I think that that's ambitious. I wouldn't bet. I wouldn't bet on it. Is, is, I guess is my answer. Um, I've mentioned a couple of times I've been in this business a long time. The problem has always been the battery, uh, always. It's, it's, and it still is, it still is the battery. Every, there are other problems, but they're easier to overcome. And you're, uh, you know, at some point, you know, there, there's, I think, you know, the easy gains have been had, right? You know, the, the weight has been taken out where it, where it can. Uh, there are some HVAC innovations coming up that, that certainly will help, particularly on the heating side. Um, so all these things are incremental and will help push us in the right direction. But, you know, we're bumping up against weight limitations, right? It's, it's, it's not even so much money. It's just when you pile more and more kilowatt hours on these buses, uh, they just get so heavy that you, you know, at some, a certain point, you, you, all, you're just, all you can carry is batteries. You can't carry more passengers. So, uh, so I, I guess I would, I would kind of flip it and say um, that, you know, maybe if you need that kind of range and you don't want to go fuel cell or you don't want to go fuel cell yet, that you need to consider some of these alternative strategies. Like you can still have a, a, a battery with a, I mean, a bus with a large battery and primarily depot charge. But if you can drop some overhead chargers at your transit center and extend the range that way, you know, the, I mean, these are the these are the kinds of questions that we're that we deal with day in and day out. And there's just there's not an easy answer. Five to ten years, um, five years especially that that just seems unlikely to me. But I would love to hear from Eric, who's uh, who's definitely a better uh, person on battery chemistry than I am. Uh, sure. So I think I'd agree with that on the five years, um, you know, th those sort of long lead times and just uh, getting getting new technologies in uh, in 10 years. Gosh, it's hard to say because um, there is such a tremendous amount of innovation and investment in batteries and 10, 10 years out uh, is is a long time. I think also an important piece of your question is 250 miles under what conditions. So is that uh, 250 miles under absolutely any condition, or uh, can is the bus allowed? Is that per day with a midday charge? Um, but just to, in the simplest example, to charge a bus up and send it out and bring it back, um, 250, I think, is a, is a real challenge. Um, the next. Uh, uh, Lori, yeah. just real quick, I just sure, want to sorry. before we go on to the next question, sure. uh, with regards to not the last, the latest question, but the one prior, I, I did want to point out that um, Leslie Udi had sent a link about with some fuel cell electric bus case studies that um, the National Energy, and NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab, has really kept a good eye on um, with with some deployments that that are available for everybody as well on, on NREL's website um, with regards to that question. I just want to point that out as well. And um, attendees should be able to see the answered questions and that's where that link was. There should be, I think I gave everyone access, it's open questions, answered, dismissed. So the link that uh, was posted in reference to that should still be in under that tab, but let me know if it's not. Um, where were we? Oh, H. Kapoor. Based on the range of limitations, can agencies use fuel cell buses and any FTA funding and any FTA funding available for pilot programs for evaluation at a smaller scale? Um, I, I think I understand it, but Eric, do you want to take that? <laughs> I, I think. Um... <laughs> I, well, I guess it I really depends. I don't think there's no FTA prohibition at all on, um, you know, Typically, if, if it's more around, you know, zero emission being either battery electric or fuel cell. So both are typically fine, but, you know, obviously, I think it would really depend on uh, what the details are for, for whatever funding program that is. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, okay, so that's more of a comment and then a question. Uh, the next question is from Tim. 
Are there current or planned transit agency partnerships for large-scale hydrogen fueling station infrastructures and or refinery? Um, Eric, do you know the answer to this? Um, so I, yeah, let me, uh, I am not aware of a specific partnership with, uh, with a, a, a plant, typically it's called, like a, a hydrogen production plant, but um, in uh, what California is creating specifically statewide with their mandates on the, um, uh, it's not renewable portfolio percentage, I don't have the right term, but uh, it used to be 33% renewable hydrogen content in any state funded programs, so it's moved up to 40%. And that is driving the industry to create larger uh, renewable hydrogen plants, um, either hydrogen or at, I'm sorry, at this point, that's a larger liquefied hydrogen plants in California. And I think you'll see that as uh, renewable options come online. Um, so I think that that is coming. These are they're just kind of long. Uh, the industry needs to see the demand typically before they'll um, create those. But I think that is coming. So. Um, just a time check, I don't, there's sort of three minutes left in our scheduled session. I don't know if anybody wants to keep answering questions. Do we need to cut it off? I'm not sure what everyone's schedule is this afternoon. Well, we could probably do one more. Okay. Uh, well, that's pressure to pick the last one. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm not sure I should be picking the last one. Um, we can, we can answer the next question on, on battery leasing. Okay. Uh, several manufacturers offer battery leasing options to reduce the initial capital cost. Is this emerging as an industry-wide option, and does this help address the concerns about battery life? Um, Eric, do you want to take that one, or Matt? I saw you on mute. I'll give it to you. To me? Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, so, I mean, the fundamental concern about, about battery life um, in my mind is, is the technical concern about the degradation. Obviously, you know, how you pay for it is, is not going to affect that. And, and you're going to, I mean, you're going to pay for it one way or the other. Um, so leasing of course is a valid option, but you know, what we find is that a lot of times, you know, that's OPEX and a lot of times uh, it's easier for transit agencies to, you know, to deal with CapEx than, than OPEX, uh, you know, with the, the FTA funding and so on. So I, I think it's a perfectly valid, um, option if it if it works for you, it certainly uh, gives you uh, some some peace of mind that you know what's going to happen. You you know what you're going to to have. You know what you're going to be paying. Uh, you you can plan for it. All those all those sorts of advantages are real advantages. But you know it doesn't in my mind it doesn't solve the fundamental problem. Eric, you you have anything to add? No, I, I agree with all that, and it's a it's a it's a question on um, risk profiles and warranties, and um, yeah, cost buckets, as you mentioned, the op opex and capex questions. Um, so yeah, nothing. Um, it, it's it's certainly an option to consider and see if it uh, if it if it solves either a funding or a risk problem um, that you have, and just yeah, you know, pencil out all the costs and see uh, com compare your options. Um, so it looks like there's a comment, uh, someone asked about fast charging or wireless, you could do that real quick, maybe. Uh, uh sure. Fast uh, charging as in, well, I mean, we've, we've been talking about, uh, a form of fast charging on route charging. Eric mentioned that for, uh, his projects, uh, the wireless or inductive charging that, um, that's also a valid option. So there's a, a couple cons for me, there's a couple concerns about the inductive charging. One is that uh, right now in the United States, at least there's a couple, a uh, couple vendors, they don't, they don't interoperate between them. So you're really, you know, you're really tied to that vendor. I guess standards are, are coming, but um, you, they're not here yet. So, and then, and then you really have to look at, oh, and another concern is, that not all of the bus OEMs offer this. And you know, particularly you can think of like the Proterra with their skateboard design. They don't really have a great place to put the secondary coil on that bus. So uh, if you're using uh, inductive charging, then maybe you're tied more to a particular uh, bus OEM and a particular charger provider. Now, all that being said, 
it does work. I, I, I worked on a research project with uh, inductive charging and it worked great. It worked flawlessly, in fact. Um, and it, it's, you know, if you have a real problem with, um, you know, needing, not needing to have something that's a low profile, you know, not over the street, of course, I mean, you still have some power electronics that you have to hide somewhere, but um, it certainly can solve some aesthetic problems for you. Uh, the, and, the, and the power level has gotten pretty, pretty good on those too. I think, you know, they're up in the 250 kilowatt range. Too, so they've always lagged a little bit behind the, uh, you know, the direct contact pantograph style charges. But uh, it's, it's certainly a valid option. It definitely works. Um, we just haven't seen a lot of uptake in it in the market. Thank you. Um, I think that's it. We're uh, over time. Um, it looks like H. Gabor had a comment rather than a question. So um, I think that wraps it up. Uh, anybody have any parting words <laughs> before I close this up? Uh, thanks, Lori. I just wanted to um, say that I hope, you know, everybody is has has had a chance to download this and hope that agencies do find it to be a useful resources resource within the industry and um, we at CT obviously hope that it helps deploy more of this technology um, as Matt had previously mentioned in the US and and worldwide so thanks everyone thank, yeah, you. thank you thanks everybody um, thank you for the present to the presenters thank you for the participants um, I today went great a lot of lively dialogue in the chat box and the questions. Uh, anybody still on? As a reminder, you will be receiving an invitation to fill out an eval for this event. Please take a minute and fill that out. It's not very long and it helps us plan for future sessions. And there will also be an updated link in that with the uh, revised PowerPoint slides that we're missing. So uh, if you re-download that, they should be there when you receive the email probably tomorrow morning. That's it. Everyone be safe, be well, and uh, have a good rest of your week. Thanks. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Great job. Bye.